Everyone, hey, welcome to Beaker Street Festival. How great is Beaker Street? Um, I mean, that's the kind of ridiculous thing I would say at the start of any event, but in this case, it is completely true. I was here last night, and at the very rare instance of being at some kind of science event without having to work, I can totally absorb the vibe. And let me tell you, this is far cooler, more inviting, and less judgy and clicky than any other science festival I have ever been to. Plus, you've got an unfound jazz bar. So, I mean, you had me with that, but you've got the science as well. So, um, it's great that you can come here a little early tonight for our live recording of Occam's Razor. So, I know I don't need to explain to anyone here what Occam's Razor is, but can I just ask you to put your hands up if you already subscribe to the Occam's Razor podcast? <laughs> right, you are my favourite. Okay, speakers had to dis had to subscribe before they were allowed to speak, but you are my favourite people. Everyone else, I want you to get your phones out right now, and if you haven't already seen one of those brochures, that tells you about all the fantastic science podcasts at the ABC. Forget about them. That's the one that you want, okay? Occam's Razor, I want you to subscribe to that. Um, and you'll be hearing this and heaps of other great stories through that podcast feed. So my name's Bernie Hobbs. I'm one of the, as you can tell from the world's coolest badge, I'm one of the science journalists at the ABC at Radio National. And um, I'm producing Occam's Razor at the moment. We used to, uh, Occam's Razor, if you have forgotten, William Bockham was a monk hundreds of years ago, and he came up with this notion that's become a fundamental principle that basically, in science, if you're trying to explain things generally, the simplest, most straightforward thing is going to end up being right. William of Ockham, the monk, clearly predated quantum physics and pretty much anything else that has happened in the last 50 or so years. Um, but, you know, mostly it still stands true. So this show's been around for 30 odd years, and the idea is to get people from in and around science who, you know, got a really strong opinion or something or got a story to tell, um, just to give them a space to really vent it. And in the last year, it's gone from being a virtual soapbox where people write a script and record it to being an actual live event soapbox. So we're wrapped to be here at Beaker Street for the second year running, and we have got four terrific speakers for you tonight. Now, uh, before we get started, we are recording this for radio, so I want you to, if you see something like this, like someone halfway through a sentence go, now before we get started, we are recording this live for radio, they're not pathologically challenged, okay? They're just repeating their sentence so we get a clean record of it for radio. So if someone loses their place along the way, they're just gonna start again and start speaking. So it's my job is easier, basically, when I'm editing. Um, so don't worry if something like that happens. The stories are gonna be great. You're going to love it. But could we just practice giving a bit of love to our storytellers? <coughs> They may not be that good, so a bit more moderate love. Let's just let's just start with the. Okay, I am fairly confident having read their scripts, they are unreal. So So tonight we're going to be covering the full gamut of topics from everyone's favourite microbiome, the vaginal microbiome, uh, right through salt marshes and uh, life drawing, obviously, because it's science, and, um, and improving kids' health literacy. So our four speakers, I'll introduce them one at a time. You give them a whole lot of love, please. And because it's a live thing, please don't feel you have to be quiet when they're speaking. You know, if you're moved by something they say, if they make you laugh, cry, or angry, just emote that. It makes very good radio. <laughs> uh, so um, without any further ado, I do want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tiffany Nelson. <coughs> Is, uh, has come all the way from the Gold Coast, so don't judge her for her food miles this weekend, they're pretty bad. Uh, she's uh, come all the way from the Gold Coast to speak at a couple of things at Beaker Street. Um, she is going to be talking to us about the second best known um, microbial biome in, uh, in humanity. And uh, what did I say before about coming up the steps for our HMS? All right, 
Okay. <laughs> so TIFF is clearly a rule breaker. You know, you try and give them a simple set of guiding instructions and, and they're over the top. Uh, I, and like every other presenter, almost every other presenter tonight, she's got one of these fantastic badges. And um, from now on, she will be known to the world as Tiffany Vaginal Microbiome, which is way cooler than Nelson. I think you'll agree. Would you join me in welcoming our first speaker this evening, Dr. Tiffany Nelson? Thank you, everyone. It's so great to be here. Um, so I am talking about the vaginal microbiome. So in the last 10 years, we have learned a lot about microbiomes, especially the ones in our gut. And I'm talking a lot. Um, we've had books and TV shows, and we've heard all about the incredible number and diversity or variety of bugs that are in our gut. They really outnumber our own cells by a factor of 10. Um, so these microbes, they play a hugely critical role in keeping us very healthy. Um, but I really want to talk to you today about the vaginal microbiome. So it's a little bit less well known, um, although most of us, half of us, know a lot about it. Um, if you haven't heard of it, don't worry. It's only started getting attention because, you know, all the professors, they're males, they don't really care, and so they get all the grants. Um, but even without science, most women, I think, will really understand the importance of your microbiome. Uh, so common disorders like thrush and vaginosis affect millions of women globally. Um, and the discomfort and itchiness and pain they bring can cause embarrassment and really curb your ability to do normal activities. Um, what might not have been clear, though, is that these disorders occur when your microbiome is knocked out of balance. Um, so just like the gut, the vagina has a huge variety of fungi and bacteria that exist in a normal situation in every woman. And uh, this, these types of organisms in the, in the vagina vary because of factors, um, a, a variety of factors, something like ethnicity, menstrual cycle, type of bath you have, when you have a bath, how hot it is, your underwear if you wear a G-string, Un, um, sexual practices, how many sexual partners you have, if you use a douche, which is flushing your vagina, um, and even smoking, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, so some of these bacteria are really tightly linked to a woman's cycle, which just reminds us that we have evolved with these microbes in our system. The most well understood of these groups is the lactobacillus. So you probably know lactobacillus because it's a starting culture in yogurt. It actually converts lactose, the sugar in milk, into the sour tasting yogurt that we have. But in the vagina, the lactobacillus convert a different type of sugar. It's glycogen, and they convert that into lactic acid. And it's this glycogen that's secreted by the cells in the vaginal wall, and the amount of glycogen changes throughout the menstrual cycle. Um, we're not quite sure exactly how it links in with the menstrual cycle. It seems to be related to your glycogen, which changes with the flow of your cycle. Um, so when estrogen levels are low, um, before puberty and then the lead up to menopause, the glycogen secretion is also low. And at these life stages, the lactobacillus is also very low in your community of your vaginal habitat. Um, during the menstrual cycle, uh, sorry, you're gonna have to edit that bit out. <laughs> I think I repeated a sentence. Um, so these lactobacillus produce so much acid that they actually convert this vaginal tract into um, a low pH, so think lemon juice sort of habitat. Um, and the lactobacillus, they love acid, and what this really does is it provides a, a protective barrier. So that low acid is not nice for other bacteria to survive there. Um, so this keeps them away, and it also prevents diseases and infections from happening. Um, so when your vaginal tract has lots of these lactobacillus producing the acid, they're also... Um, I'll start again. Um, so, <laughs> so when your vaginal tract has lots of lactobacillus and an acidic pH, you are less likely to get STIs, so sexually transmitted infections, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV. The, these are all reduced in situations when you have a very high lactobacillus. 
Um, so the dominance doesn't, of these lactobacillus doesn't just prevent infection, it helps out during pregnancy as well. Um, so the concentration of lactobacillus in the vagina is often much more stable during pregnancy and with a higher than normal estrogen occurring during this life stage. If your lactobacillus is, is thriving when you're pregnant, you'll be less likely to have a miscarriage. You'll also have a much higher chance of falling pregnant in the first place if you have a dominant lactobacillus. So these important reproductive milestones in your life as a woman, um, the vaginal habitat is really strongly protected by the lactobacillus and it really highlights this, this strong relationship, this evolution that we have with these bugs in our systems. Um, Sometimes in our life things happen or we exhibit behaviours perhaps that disrupt the balance of these vaginal microbiome. Um, so on, on occasion we might end up with a low abundance of lactobacillus. Um, without these lactobacillus for fermenting the glycogen to acid, the pH in the vagina becomes less acidic. Um, one familiar cause could be taking an antibiotic, for example. Um, almost 40% of women end up with thrush when antibiotics knock out their lactobacillus. And without that acid in the environment, the thrush-causing fungi are able to sort of like get a foothold, pardon the pun, and really naturally occurs those, um, allows them to survive in that now higher acid level. Um, so there's other factors apart from antibiotics that can mess with our lactobacillus or glycogen balance and they're the subject of, of a lot of the research that I've been involved with. Um, so even our sex partners and the number of them that, that we have over our life and in a, a periods of, of years um, can really have an impact on the vaginal microbiome. So if you've had one male sex partner, for example, in the past six months instead of zero, you may have a lower production of glycogen and lower levels, therefore, of protective lactobacillus. But if you have more than two male sex partners, it appears that this is no different than having no partners in terms of your protective lactobacillus levels. So this is not just li not lifestyle advice at all, it's just, it's just science. Um, and researchers are kind of looking at all these factors um, besides our sex partners. So things like body mass index, if you have a higher BMI, you might have a higher chance that you won't produce as much as much glycogen. Um, increases in stress hormones can reduce the dominance of the lactobacillus, and those stress hormones can somehow protect bacteria that couldn't normally survive the acid environment. Um, unfortunately, having this greater diversity of bacteria and this low lactobacillus in the vaginal tract can really cause discomfort in the form of a symptomatic bacterial vaginosis in some of the women. Um, one of the more noticeable symptoms in BV or bacterial vaginosis is malodor. This happens because the other bacteria, this now diverse community of bacteria, they do not convert the glycogen to acid. They feed on other compounds. They actually use amino acids and convert those into polyamines. Um, so we have na these polyamines have names like cadaverine and putrescine, and it's not surprising they have a foul odour because putrescine comes from the word putrefaction, cadaverine comes from the word cadaver or dead body. Um, so these are not nice things to have in that region of your body. Um, so the strong risk factors for things like BV are when you have a new sex partners or multiple sex partners over short periods of time. If you started sex earlier in your life, um, under the age of 16, you're often more at risk. Not using condoms, receiving oral sex, vaginal douching. Um, generally speaking, women who had their first sexual intercourse before 16, as I mentioned, um, and women with more than three sexual partners in the previous year are just more likely to experience BV. Um, there's another risk factor that I mentioned, and that was smoking. Um, so in a study I was involved with, we looked at the impact of smoking on BV in a group, a cohort of women. And we found that if you smoke cigarettes, you are more likely to have a lower than normal abundance. You are more likely to have a lower than normal abundance of lactobacillus and then to ha develop BV. Um, just how this relationship works is not incredibly clear, but when we take a swab from the vagina, it produces a result that is actually similar to the swab you see in your mouth. We just have a similar habitat and microbiome there. So compounds like nicotine and tobacco are present in the vagina of women who do smoke. And if you've been taking things like cocaine or painkillers or analgesics, we also see these compounds in your vaginal um, swab, in your vaginal habitat. 
So smoking and BV don't just affect odour, they can also impact pregnancy too. Um, so smoking or having BV decreases the levels of other compounds in your vagina called dipeptides. So these depleted levels of dipeptides have been linked to miscarriage during pregnancy. And this is hinting again at that complex protective effects of lactobacillus and the negative impacts of smoking or other sexual behaviours that reduce our lactobacillus and our glycogen. It's still early days in really understanding the vaginal microbiome, but it's really clearly complex ecosystem. And there's some pretty impressive health benefits. So if you needed yet another reason to cut down your stress or give up smoking, just go with the latest science and think of your vagina. And thank you. <laughs> uh, keep that going for Tip Nelson. First cab off the rank. I hope you had all read the uh, topics of the talks today because I, I noticed there are a few people who might be under 18 in the audience. I'm not sure how much their parents were banking on hearing about underage sex, cocaine and, uh, and a whole bunch of other things in that, but um, we're all grown-ups here, most of us. Uh, um, give it up again for Tiff Nelson. The vaginal microbiome, who knew? Some great stuff there. Again, you can uh, hear Tiff in more detail talking about this tonight. I can see so many men going, yes, please, I want to hear this. Uh, at 8 o'clock right here, is that right? 8 o'clock right here this evening. So um, it's a really interesting area of research, as is the research done by Vishnu Prahalad. Uh, Vishnu is from University of Tasmania. He's a lecturer in physical geography, and uh, he's got a massive crush on wetlands and in particular the kind of wetlands that don't have trees the salt marshes uh, but he's also um he's not just you know a scientist he's not just out there digging the dig and counting the species and and that sort of thing he's uh he's pretty engaged in talking the talk as well and finding great ways of communicating his work and facing some of the challenges there and you may very well have in your own kitchen an artwork that comes down to some of, uh, of Vishnu's research, and you're going to hear a bit about that in this talk now. So please give it up for Dr. Vishnu Prala. If you noticed, I did come up the right way, <laughs> which I hardly ever do in the field. All right, I want to start by asking you a question, and that is, how many of you have been to a beach? any beach. Well, that's most of us, unsurprisingly so. Can I also ask then, how many of you have been to a coastal salt marsh? Well, oh, quite a few. Well, this is a biased sample, but <laughs> what generally not many people do, and maybe people who don't go to a salt marsh maybe have driven past one on the way to the beach. In fact, if you think about it, most of our beaches in Tasmania have a salt marsh behind them. And indeed, in many parts of Australia, or if you go closer to the tropics, you start to see mangroves, which are basically salt marshes with trees in them. Well, I haven't been to a salt marsh either about 11 years ago when my thesis, master's thesis supervisor took me to my first salt marsh uh, near Hobart. And I have since fell in love with salt marshes. In the last 10, 11 years, I've spent time studying them, visiting them around the state, mapping them, and also, importantly, communicating about their values across this beautiful island state. During this time I've spent visiting salt marshes, I've come to think of them as riches behind our beaches. Riches because besides their intrinsic beauty, they also perform a lot of important functions like fish nurseries, water purification, and also habitat for biodiversity, for example, over 100 species of birds. And if you're concerned about climate change, salt marshes are one of the most important habitats in the world uh, in terms of carbon sinks and carbon sequestration. Well, despite these important functions, we have lost over a half of our salt marshes across the world and also in Tasmania. Uh, because of this loss, they have recently been listed under the federal Australian environmental legislation as a threatened ecological community. Given this context, clearly doing more science is important to continue their conservation work. Oops. 
For example, we still know very little about some of the birds, mammals, and fish that are in our salt marshes. For example, in our most recent study, for the first time anywhere, we've recorded a Western Australian salmon in our salt marshes. So clearly, doing science is very important. But also, communicating that science is perhaps more important, and something that I want to talk about here, given my past 10 years communicating the science of salt marshes. So I want to go through this as four key lessons. And the first one is generally well known by now, that our science need to be communicated beyond academic publications to be made more accessible. And we scientists are well positioned to do this. After all, we write the scripts. And unlike most novelists who write fiction, our stories have a 95% confidence interval. <laughs> or, or some such measure of accuracy. And also, our stories can be stranger than fiction. Again, if you think about it, what we write about is already acted out in a million stages across the world by a whole range of actors, from burrowing crabs to birds to the carbon in the soil. Scientists are clearly storytellers, and we do have an obligation as publicly funded researchers to take our story to the public at large. Which brings me to my second lesson, which is that different stories engage different people. That is, meeting people where they are and finding out what they are interested in. Uh, for example, once I met a farmer uh, close to Hobart who had a lot of salt marshes in his property, we started talking about farming and wetlands, and soon enough it beca became clear that he had a soft spot for birds. And birds then became an entry point to talk about conservation with that person on the ground. I contrast that with the more remote part of the state where talking about birds is seen as elitist, something that the dreamers from the cities do, not them. Uh, incidentally enough, I met some locals recently doing salt marsh research work, collecting fish, and we got along famously talking about salmon and mullets and other fish. And imagine this, there we were in the middle of the marsh, knee deep in water, on the same page talking about the role salt marshes play as fish nurseries. That remarkable experience drove home to be the message that as scientists, we can do better to develop stories that appeal to a range of values. Lesson number three, and a very important and interesting one is that the stories are clearly important, but the way we communicate those stories is also important. Effective science communication, as I see it, is indeed an art form, an art form of aesthetics and entertainment to capture and expand our imagination. As far as I can see, as a, at a fundamental level, I don't quite understand how scientists are any different from musicians in this regard. Well, you can test this. Ask a scientist if she would rather go to a science conference or a music festival. Well, uh, I know where I'll go. I want to draw upon two important case studies to illustrate this important point I'm make, trying to make here, that science communication is an art form. The first one relates to a, a paper we wrote on birds. Well, left at that for an average academic paper, uh, we could you know, get all the people who would potentially read the paper in this very room. Well, that's an interesting thought. Uh, but what happened was that luckily I was working at this time with a local science, science illustrator and a children's book illustrator called B Captain Blueberry, or Rachel. Well, she did a great job illustrating some of the birds from the, post, uh, from the paper, and we put together the birds into a beautiful poster, and with the help of the local birds group, BirdLife Tasmania, and a local bookshop, we managed to sell over 500 of these posters. That is to think about that people would buy this poster, pay $5 to buy this poster, uh, which is essentially a copy of our review paper and take it back to their house. And that's quite remarkable to think about it that way. People who liked the poster also wanted it as tea towels. And we did indeed, <laughs> indeed oblige and make tea towels. Uh, and we now have those tea towels in over 300 kitchens around the state and indeed some part, other parts of the world. Well, the second example I had was also involving the same artist, and uh, this time I had just about enough money uh, to put together a field guide to the plants of Tasmanian salt marshes, and the agency that provided the seed funding at the time uh, told me that maybe we can, we can print 50 copies to account for every person in the state who could potentially be interested in the book. <laughs> 
Well, I took uh, the manuscript to uh, Rachel, Captain Blueberry, uh, with the brief that uh, to make the book look and feel like something you'd want to have in your bookshelf, irrespective of its contents. The end product was this beautiful little book that came out with the same look and feel as a tastefully packaged block of chocolate. <laughs> uh, the proof of the chocolate is in its eating, and I'm happy to say we've sold more than 1,800 copies of the book. Not bad for an initial uh, pr print run of, of 50. So aesthetics and good artwork really matter, and they are the key to open doors before we can create a receptive space for talking about other matters. Well, lesson number four, and the last one, is that, as you can per perhaps tell, all of this stuff is really fascinating, and as a scientist, both personally and socially rewarding uh, for, you be, for your science to be taken into people's lives and their imagination. As an early career researcher in my mid-30s, I could do this for another 30 years, or, or perhaps more. But as I let my thoughts go in this direction, I ask two questions, and that is, what am I expecting to get out of this work in terms of conservation outcomes? And second one, what, if anything, I might undo in this process. The first one's easier to answer. Robert Pyle, uh, the renowned entomologist, answered this question in the 1970s when he put forward the idea of the extinction of experience, where people who don't know don't care or indeed cannot be expected to care. In other words, to conserve nature, nature must exist in people's imagination and lived experience. And in this regard, science communication is critical and crucial. Turning to the second question, however, what might I undo in this process? Well, people who don't know don't care, well, sure. But even if people knew, is there enough care to go around for all the nature that needs caring for? Would getting people more interested in salt marshes perhaps take away the care needed for other threatened species and communities? Take the example of Tasmania, where conservation groups and their efforts are largely engrossed on forests, the occasional parrot or two, the eagle, and the tassie devil. The capacity of these groups have been limited to also be able to take up the costs of wetlands, naturally, let alone other habitats and species that might require, co require conservation, like butterflies or beetles. Well, dwelling on this question has given me pause to think about the broader social and indeed political context of conservation. Yes, getting people to care is necessary, but it can never be sufficient if the end goal is conservation. Do we involved in conservation need to take a more strategic approach uh, in terms of where we direct our concern? What will it take to get conservation values adopted on a broad scale beyond the cute, cuddly, and charismatic? Well, one thing is clear, and I'll end with this note. We can't just do what we are doing, which is research, publish, and repeat because while the number of published academic papers continues to rise, our biodiversity continues to decline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vishnu. And I have to say, I think it's probably something we all love about science. When you come up with against a tricky issue like like the risk that by trying to get people to care about salt marshes or wetlands in general, you might be drawing them away from other issues that also need concern, that that's actually something to spur you on and, and make you work further into it. Science isn't about shying away from, from the hard questions. Clearly, it's not a question that science has the answers to, but um, talking about it can only help. So give it up again for Vishnu Prahalad. And are you... Selling books and tea towels? No, no, uh, not today. Just having a day off. It is the weekend. Bullets. Yeah, what's that? Bullets. Bullets. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, not a local. Fuller's Bookshop. Well, having said that, check out these boots that I got from a consignment store around the corner here today. That is my new favourite thing about Hobart. Recycle, recycle. Um, our third speaker this afternoon is a local. Uh, Dr Rosie Nash uh, has, wears a few hats. Um, she's going to tell you about a couple of them. But uh, she's a public health lecturer and, and researcher at University of Tasmania. And she's the co-founder of the soon-to-be global enterprise, 
or something, uh, Health Lit for Kids. So give it up for health fanatic, runner, winter ocean swimmer, general maniac, Dr Rosie Nash. Good evening, everyone. Can I get a raise of hands? Who here is a parent? There's a few out there. What about teachers or principals? Yep, a few there. Okay, the rest of you might not be so interested in this, but hopefully. <laughs> so like a lot of women, I have two careers, and both of them have fed into a project that is about to go from Tassie to the world stage, hopefully changing lives along the way. My first career is as a pharmacist, and while I was working in the hospital, I would occasionally meet a middle-aged man just after he'd had major heart surgery. Some of these guys had just had all of their four pipes plumbed and they were keen to get home. Not so they could change their diet or activity. Not so they could rest and recover. No, so they could take off their nicotine patch and have a smoke. Now I work in health literacy where the goal is to help everyone to better understand the things that affect their health. And health literacy is non-judgmental. And I'm not judging, but I couldn't help thinking, why, why are we spending all of this money on heart surgery when really it is too late for some? Okay, that does sound a bit judgy. <laughs> what I really mean is, why don't we make, do more, spend more on prevention when people are younger before it's too late? And that question has only been amplified by my other career. I'm also a mum of two beautiful children, Maddie and Thomas. They're here tonight, just over there. Early on in my mum career, it became apparent that my kids were benefiting from having two health conscious parents who were fluent in health vocabulary. Ever since Maddie and Tom were little, we've role modelled a healthy lifestyle for them. Well, most of the time, anyway. It got me thinking, my kids are getting an advantage, but what could be done for the other kids so they could benefit from learning about their health, even if their own parents weren't engaging or interested in the topic? In other words, how can we prevent our next generation of Tasmanian children becoming adults who suffer heart attacks needing major surgery? Because right now, Tasmanians have the lowest levels of health literacy and some of the worst health outcomes in our country. And after talking with my friend and colleague, Dr Shandell Elmer, about the idea, Health Lit for Kids was born. Our program involves prim helping primary schools and their communities to give all our kids the advantage of knowing more about healthy living. It's literally Health Lit for Kids and it's fun. It started with a single pilot primary school, shout out to Blackwoods Bay Primary, where we refined and tested our program. Since then, with the generous funds from the Tasmanian Community Fund, we have modified and run the program in four more primary schools across Tasmania, from Burnie to New Norfolk. And it became really clear, each school was unique, with their own health and wellbeing priorities. So this would not be some one size fits all prospect. No, so at each school, we start off by meeting with the school community, the principal, the teachers, the parents, and the children. And we use their local wisdom to develop their own school-wide Health Lit for Kids action plan. We listen, yes, we listen. We listen and they use our tools to identify the issues that they need us to help them to focus on. They were things like anxiety, smoking, yes, smoking in primary school, nutrition and physical inactivity. Once the school's action plan was designed, teachers create lesson plans focused on health issues relevant to their class and children. And we've seen everything from classic kinder cut and paste to high tech coding. See, Health Lit for Kids only had three rules. One, the teachers had to follow the Australian curriculum. Two, the unit of learning had to develop health literacy skills. 
and three, the work had to include the creation of something that could be shared with others. It could be a poem, it could be a model, garden bed, podcast, collage, anything really, limited by the imagination of the children and the teacher. We call these creations artefacts, and they are at the heart of the successes we've seen. When I first thought about Health Lit for Kids, I was mostly focused on the long-term health benefits. But did you know that health literacy affects how well our children do at school? As one of our teachers at our first Health Lit for Kids workshop said, oh, I get it now. In order to be numerate and literate, they have to be functioning. <laughs> so with this in mind, at one of our schools, the early years teachers worked together on food and nutrition, starting with the school lunchbox. To kick things off, the teachers read the storybook, Eat a Rainbow, to the kinder, prep, year one and two classes. Then they painted a huge, huge cardboard rainbow and they cut it into four wedges, one for each of the classes. For the next six weeks, each time a child ate a piece of fruit or veg at school, they could glue one coloured paddy case on the matching section of the rainbow. So a yellow paddy case for eating a banana or an orange paddy case for carrot sticks. Motivated by the thought of adding that paddy case to the rainbow segment, the children started to bring in and eat more fruit and veg every day. And the teachers, they noticed that because they were filling up on more fruit and veg, their packaged snacks were going home in their lunch boxes, uneaten. As most parents listening would know, usually it's the other way around. So another school focused on physical activity and they went pretty high tech. Grade three children there used Fitbits, which they made and coded themselves. Grade three. They each designed a personal activity pyramid too. At the base of the pyramid were the activities they would do most. So walking the dog, riding their bike. At the peak of the pyramid, they included the activities that the children thought that they should do least. So in Emmy's case, this was playing on her iPad. The best bit? If you scan that QR code on the corner of Emmy's activity pyramid, you can see her coding and also how physically active Emmy had been in that last month. Captured by that Fitbit that she'd actually made herself. So this teacher had planned to do coding with her grade three class anyway. But with the motivation of producing Health Lit for Kids artifacts, she managed to cover off on five different parts of the Australian curriculum. So this last one is my very favourite, the Carton of Calm. One teacher recognised that a number of her Grade 3 students were suffering from anxiety. Each child was given an egg carton and 12 strips of paper. They wrote down 12 calming statements or activities, ideas that would help them to feel calm. For example, I'm going to lie on my bed and listen to my music. Each strip was then rolled up and placed into the 12 holes in that egg carton. Once completed, the Carton of Calm offered each child a set of personally designed solutions to draw on when they were not feeling so calm. Each of our schools decided to have an expo at the end of the year so that the children could share their artefacts with their families and the local community. The artefacts, well, the artefacts provided the children with a voice. It helped them to start conversations about their health and the health of others. And at one of our schools, the teachers couldn't believe how many parents turned up to the expo. They had been uh, bringing out extra seating all afternoon. They said that they'd never seen the parents so engaged. Our teachers also described the development of a new health vocabulary and overheard the children initiating their own conversations about health in the classroom as well as in the playground. So you might be thinking, oh well, it's all very well and good to educate the children, but if the parents aren't interested or won't engage, then we still come to school and with their junk, the junk in their lunchboxes, won't they? Well, I disagree. 
and I think when provided with the opportunity to express themselves with an age-appropriate voice, like the artefacts, our children can use their pester power for good. <laughs> like the grade three girl who used her newfound skills in reading food labels to challenge her mum about how much salt and sugar was in that cereal she was about to buy. What about Jane? Jane, who saw her mum getting really stressed. They were rushing out the door one morning and she suggested, perhaps mum, you might benefit from waking one of those cartons of calm too. <laughs> and because Health Live for Kids is a whole of school program, it is really hard for a disengaged parent to escape it. This was highlighted by one of our teachers who described that one of the parents had noticed this health focus and paraphernalia all around the classes in the older grades. When the parent came into the early years classroom, she exclaimed, oh no, you're not doing this health stuff too, are you? Defeated, in the end, she joined in the fruit and vegetable challenge, trying and reportedly enjoying vegetables that she'd never eaten before alongside her four-year-old son. So my answer to the critics, children can influence their parents' choices if empowered with the asset of health literacy. So how's it all going now then, I hear you ask? Well, normally with a pilot project like this, you sort of publish a paper or two, you might try and get it into some more schools or some other states. Well, we'd love that to happen too. And I'm hoping the Minister for Education and Health are both listening right now. But we've been very busy because Health Live for Kids has gone from a local pilot project here in Tasmania to the World Health Organisation. After presenting... <laughs> so after presenting at an international health promotion conference in New Zealand, there's good mountain biking there too, but not quite as good as Tassie, and some very helpful follow-up networking, it's been confirmed that Health Lift for Kids will be a World Health Organisation demonstration program. What does that mean? Well, that means that we're going to share our program and our data with the rest of the world. As an example of how to improve the health literacy of communities and reduce avoidable conditions like heart disease, diabetes and stroke. And I think it's really cool that a Tassie project like Health Lit for Kids could be adopted in schools around the world. We're proud that it's locally relevant and global in reach. And hopefully, down the track, we'll have fewer patients keen to get home from hospital for a ciggy because they won't have needed that heart surgery in the first place. <laughs> Thank you. Great work, Rosie. Um, I love those kids using their pester power for good. That's great. And it's nice for children not to have to suggest Valium to the mothers anymore. Like, it's good that we've moved on since those days. Um, our final speaker, in fact, we'll have some time for questions a little later on. So um, if you're busting to ask one of our speakers uh, something about their work, hold on for a moment. We've got one more speaker. And she's probably a familiar face because uh, she's been based in Hobart, went to uni here, and in fact was the assistant festival director at Beaker Street for the last couple of years as well. But these days, Zoe Keane is slumming it in Sydney as the Darren Osborne cadet science journalist with us at RN and ABC Sydney. So um, Zoe has a background in science. She has a lot of backgrounds, actually, our Zoe. Uh, and as well as her background in science, uh, she's got a big interest in art. And it's the latter that she's going to be talking about, at least initially, with you now. Please join me in welcoming Zoe King. <laughs> G'day, Beaker Street. I'm going to start with a question as well, and that question is when was the last time you saw somebody naked? And when was the last time that person was a stranger to you? I'm just going to leave you with that one for a while. <laughs> Maybe don't ask partners, I don't know. <laughs> I attended my first life drawing class 
when I was a teenager, about 15 years ago. And I've been involved in life drawing in one way or another ever since that time. So what is life drawing? Life drawing involves one or more nude models coming, posing, and drawers coming to, well, draw them. I've run life drawing here in Hobart for the past five years. This is how most of the sessions I run go down. There is a model, that model might be of any gender, and there are drawers. Drawers sit or stand around the model. They can use whatever medium they prefer, um, and the model's poses are timed. My drawers are a mix of people. Some people haven't picked up a pencil since primary school, and often you can pick them because they're really nervous, but they're great. Other people are professional artists and have drawn every day of you know, their adult life. But what does this have to do with science? Well, as well as being a life drawing enthusiast, I'm also a really big science nerd. I actually started this life drawing business to kind of help pay the rent while I was doing my science degree. Being science inclined, I can't see a situation without trying to interrogate what's actually going on there. Something I've noticed over probably hundreds of life drawing and sessions is the impact that life drawing can have on people. It's really transformative. People go to life drawing because it makes them feel great. But why? Why does it make you feel so good? Well, let me unpack that a bit. Our culture has two dominant ways of interacting with adult nakedness. One is in a medical setting, and the other is through sex. Now, medicine and sex are both great, and you won't find me dissing them here, but they do have something in common, <laughs> and that thing is a certain way of objectifying the body. So, in certain medical practices, the body can be left feeling like an object. And the same is true for certain commodified forms of sexuality. And this is kind of the way that we interact with the naked body and we experience our own naked bodies a lot of the time. So now hold on to your hats, people, or button up your love coats. I'm about to introduce the science. I'd like to introduce you to the idea of embodiment. Embodiment is a process where people feel connected and comfortable in their bodies. When you feel embodied, you feel connected to your body's needs. You feel connected to its desires. You respect those needs and desires and you meet them. When people feel embodied, they use their bodies as something for self-expression, something for agency. They see their body as part of their well-being. So embodiment is kind of the polar opposite of objectification. Sounds fantastic, right? The body and the mind are integrated at last. Amazing. According to the Embodied Model of Positive Body Image, proposed by Menzel and Levine in 2011, so this is pretty recent stuff, embodiment can help promote positive body image. This is by reducing the amount we self-objectify. And by that self-objectification, I mean it kind of puts the brakes, embodiment puts the brakes on that snipey little observer in your head that picks and criticises the way you look or the way you feel about your body. So among you in the audience tonight, you probably have really varied levels of embodiment. But that's okay, because the great thing is psychologists are looking into activities that can actually help you feel more embodied. For instance, there's a bit of debate going on as to whether competitive athletics will do the trick. But there does seem to be some consensus around dance. Street dance, contemporary dance and pole dancing have all been found to help people be more embodied as does direct contact with nature. So being in nature can make you feel more embodied. In so where does life drawing come in? In some ways, it might seem counterintuitive that con like critically inspecting another naked body would make you feel more embodied yourself and less likely to objectify yourself. But from my years in life drawing, I've always had an inkling that this was indeed the case. Having attended life drawing through my years as a bit of a roly-poly teenager, I've always credited it with helping me... With, oh, I'll start that one again for the radio. <laughs> um, having, um, having attended life drawing through my years as a roly-poly teenager, I've always credited it with it helping me skate over some of the problems of body image that my peers struggled with. 
Every week, I saw different bodies. I saw old bodies and I saw young bodies. I saw bodies of different backgrounds and different shapes. I knew that no body was weird, or that maybe every body is a little bit weird, but it's in its own special and glorious way. As an organizer of sessions, I make sure to mix up my models, different adult ages, sizes, backgrounds, and abilities. What I have noticed as I observe drawers in my sessions, oh, was that two? Sorry. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Sorry about that. Cut to radio. Anyway. <laughs> What I have noticed as I observe the drawers in my sessions is that spending time drawing a nude model is an exercise in extreme empathy. It goes beyond just seeing the diversity in the way we all look. In a 20-minute pose, you are minutely observing someone. And we are seldom given the permission in our culture to spend that time looking at another person. Not only that, you are trying to capture what is beautiful in a pose. You're capturing the essence of a person and what's beautiful about them and representing them on the page. It's really powerful stuff. And I've always thought that extending that empathy and that kindness to the model, that's got to splash back onto ourselves. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but let's turn to the experts. Professor Viram Swamy is a leading researcher in body image and in human attraction. He's based in the UK. Viram has investigated how life drawing classes impacts our feelings of embodiment and in terms our body images. In the examples of embodiment I lifted, listed before, you actually had to participate in the activity to feel embodied. So you had to dance or you had to be in nature. But the thing is, that's not accessible to everyone. Not everyone is comfortable or able to dance. And in a big city, having just moved to Sydney, I know this, it can be really hard to access nature. So he was wondering if maybe the impact of embodiment could be achieved a little bit more vicariously through life drawing. Swami thought perhaps, and I quote this, the process of observing and receiving sensory feedback from a nude human body and the active reproduction of that body in art form contain embodying elements that promote positive body image. He also wondered if specifically life drawing might provide a transitional space for individuals to explore relationships with their own bodies, to question and challenge normative beauty ideals, to actively inhabit their bodies as subjective rather than objectified sites, and to develop greater body confidence. Something tells me that Swami and I, we would get along. <laughs> so being a scientist, Swami set out to test these ideas. He surveyed British men and women and found that greater lifetime attendance in life drawing classes, um, greater lifetime attendance in life drawing classes was associated with um, greater body appreciation in men and women and a lower drive for thinness in women. So that was a great start, but as any science enthusiast will tell you, correlation does not cause does not mean causation. It was a survey, and it's very hard to tell if it was actually the life drawing that was made people feel more embodied. Or maybe if you're more embodied, you're more confident to go to life drawing. So he wasn't quite sure. So he thought he'd actually set up some experiments. Next, he ran a study with 37 self-selected undergraduate women. They were surveyed before and after taking their first life drawing class. His finding from this survey suggested that attending this class may have helped with their embodiment and positive body image. But still, I don't think this is a slam dunk. I mean, for the science of life drawing and embodiment. And neither did Swami. It was kind of limited in a few ways, this study. I mean, 37 undergraduate students? Like, that's not a representative sample. And also, how do we know that it was drawing a, a nude human figure that made these people feel more embodied? You know, drawing, you know, when, when do you get to be that focused? When do you get to spend time looking at something, being creative, making art? Maybe being, you could get embodied by just drawing a bowl of fruit or something. And also, this is very short term. People were surveyed before and they were surveyed straight after. So it was all a little limited and he knew this. So he thought he'd test the next idea. Is this, um, do, we, do we need to have a nude model? And he found that, yeah, actually we do. He set up three different classes, one drawing a nude model, one drawing in an, ab in, an inanimate... In <laughs> One drawing a bowl of fruit, 
and another one drawing a clothed model. He found that drawing a nude model made people feel far more embodied than when they were drawing a clothed model and far more embodied than when they were drawing the object that may have been a bowl of fruit. <laughs> he actually didn't specify in the study. Um, and so that was great. So, you know, he's getting this sense that drawing a nude body, you know, has a thing. But he thought he'd test whether maybe, you know, this applied to men and whether it could have a longer-term effect. So he set up a six-week trial where, again, self-selected participants uh, got to... I've totally lost my place. <laughs> um, self-selected uh, self participants were involved in a six-week course um, of life drawing. And again, he found that it had a really, really um, positive impact on people's body image. But the thing that he also found is that that kind of negative voice, so people's drive for thinness and drive for muscularity, it wasn't affected by just a six-week course. But their feeling of positive body image was affected, and they felt a lot more embodied and had way better body image after this. So, as I kind of indicated when I introduced Swami, this is really new stuff. This is new science. And I think there's a lot more that we can learn about the science of life drawing, the science of embodiment, and um, how this kind of activity can help people, help people live a more meaningful life. When I started writing this talk, I put out the call to my drawers, why do you love life drawing? And while seeing diverse bodies and an increase in body image did come up, it absolutely wasn't the only thing. People told me that they love life drawing for the mindfulness, that they feel relaxed after a session. Other people told me they love the discipline of the pose, while still others came to life drawing for the community. So what do we get here? Where do we end up? To me, this is a question that science has for us. What does life drawing do for our minds? What does life drawing do to heal our relationship with our bodies? And so this is a challenge I put out to the scientific community. Can you study this for me? <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Zoe. Um, just put your hand up if you were still thinking about that nude body that uh, Zoe asked you about at the start. Yes, I thought you were. Uh, it's um, it's been a great time. Unfortunately, we are like spot on time, and um, that means we don't really have any time for for questions. But you will notice that all of our speakers are wearing their little fancy light up badges, and they're going to stick around. So if you want to have a chat with them this evening, um, just feel free to come up and uh, and say good day, ask a question. Um, also, uh, Tiff's going to be speaking, as I mentioned earlier, at eight o'clock here on main stage, and. Zoe and I, as much as we love each other at work, oh yeah, we're going the full fisticuffs uh, for the science friction debate a little later on tonight, which will be hosted by none other than Natasha Mitchell here again on this stage, I think at 8.45 or 9, roughly. Uh, check your guides. When? That's Tash now. <laughs> she is like a voice in my head every now and then when I need guidance, so <laughs> it's good to know why. Um, it has been great to have you here this afternoon. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of Beaker Street and give it up again for all of our speakers and Falcons Razor.